wants new and younger audiences in their concert halls or in their arts venues? <laughs> Applause, yes. <laughs> Again, my name is Aubrey Bergauer, and I'm the executive director of the California Symphony, as Eric said. And the California Symphony is a professional orchestra based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And what you need to know about the California Symphony is what Eric alluded to. Over the last four seasons, we have nearly doubled our audience size and quadrupled our donor base. Who wants to double their audience size and quadruple their donor base? Good answer. By way of introduction, before coming to California, I spent about a decade in Seattle there working for the leading institutions, Seattle Symphony, Seattle Opera, and the Bumbershoot Music and Arts Festival, all of which is to say my experience is at organizations of all sizes. And at every one of those organizations, we had the same problem. That problem is that 90% of first-time attendees never come back again for a second visit. 90% of first-time attendees never come back again for a second visit. That's the latest statistic uh, for American orchestras. So whether or not that specific number is true for your organization or not, the reality is the vast majority of first-timers never come back. That's what the Orchestra X project was all about, to figure out why that is and what we can do about it. So uh, for our time together today, I will walk you through the project and the results for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Sound good? <laughs> Terry Teachout at the Wall Street Journal uh, covered this project. He was most impressed with the website changes we made, probably because those changes cost how much to implement? Zero dollars. Who likes free solutions that make a big difference at your organization? <laughs> Good answer, although laughter, maybe laughter isn't a good answer, I don't know. Uh, the best part of this quote, though, is that these findings that I will share with you today are not for millennials only. We sought out to learn from millennials and Gen Xers, and our findings were much broader than that. And as you know, and I know, our jobs as arts administrators are much broader than those demographics, right? So it's good news that these are things that every organization needs to be thinking about and acting on. So to walk you through it, we're going to look at what is Orchestra X and why did we do it, followed by what exactly we did, how did the study play out, what did we learn, and how we responded. This is the bulk of the presentation. There are four areas or themes of our findings that emerged that I will share with you. And then what's next? Some things we are still working on and uh, things that came out of this group that we are still addressing sort of in a 2.0 version of the project. And lastly, some conclusions and results. How has this played out in the website metrics for us at the California Symphony? Throughout all of this, we will talk about easy uh, action items, tactics that you can implement at your orchestra, too. Who likes easy ideas that you can implement at your arts organization? <laughs> Good, lots of hands. All right, so here we go. Uh, what and why is Orchestra X? First, the why. The first reason why we took on this project is because of the availability heuristic. Now, the availability heuristic is not a classical music term. It's not an arts term. The availability heuristic is a psychological term. And the availability heuristic is how we as humans make thousands of decisions every day based on information we already know to be true. So this is a good thing. This is how we as a species survive. What is not good, though, about the availability heuristic is that it means we as a species rely too much on what we already know to be true. And when we are talking about classical music, as is the case at my organization, or your arts discipline, as is the case at your organization, what we know to be true is very different than what a newcomer knows, right? Right. So the availability heuristic, that's why we took on this project. The second reason why we took on this project is because the California Symphony wants to be customer obsessed. Many of us care about our customers, but many organizations are product obsessed. Who cares a lot about what you put on stage or what you put on your walls at your museums? Nobody? There we go, we are product obsessed. That's a good thing, we care about these things. We are often revenue obsessed. Who wants money to fund their mission? Some of you, okay. <laughs> 
We care about these things and we obsess about these things and that is part of our jobs. But very rarely is an organization by far and away at the top of the list customer obsessed. And at the California Symphony, we said that's what we want to put at the top. The last reason why we took on this project is to improve user experience. Uh, this is a UX research project, and research shows, latest research on consumer behavior shows that loyalty, more than any other factor, is determined by ease of use more than loyalty programs, more than surprise and delight. The latest research shows ease of use determines loyalty. And when we think about how many steps there are before somebody even sets foot in our venue, or hears the first note of music played, as is the case with an orchestra, there are a lot of different points for friction and uh, possible unease of use. So at the California Symphony, we wanted to get a better understanding of those UX touch points and start chipping away at making that experience easier. And lastly, what? In its simplest form, what is Orchestra X? It is a discussion group. We put out the call for people to participate. We said, originally, if you are a millennial or a Gen Xer, uh, who should go to the symphony? Meaning, you are smart, culturally aware, have some expendable income, and you do frequent other live entertainment options. We said, if that's you, you should go to the symphony. But for whatever reason you don't, we want to hear from you. We said, uh, we will ask you for your time and thoughts, but never for a donation. That's not what this project is about. And we said, we want you to go to a few concerts and report back the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we're going to listen to it. So we laid out the expectations for this group. We said, if you're going to participate in the Orchestra X project, you can come to as many concerts as you'd like. The concert will be what we call the basement price of $5 each. Uh, not free, because free has no value. Free has a higher dropout rate. And uh, we wanted this group to have to go through the purchase path as a regular patron might. Therefore, we had to charge something. So we said, the basement price of $5, if you want to bring a companion for another $5, that's fine. You can go to as many concerts in the season as you'd like, but there is one concert in particular that is required in order to have a shared experience among all of our participants from which to speak about in our discussion group. We said you had to spend some time on our website as a regular patron might, figuring out which concerts you'd like to attend, again, going through the purchase path, all of that. You have to do that if you're going to participate in this project. We said you have to join our email list and mailing list for the rest of the season. After that, you can unsubscribe if you want. But for this season, you got to be on the list. And we said you need to keep some notes on your experience with us. We said we don't need a novel, but if something makes you think, or if something uh, really does make sense to you, or if something uh, doesn't make sense to you, whatever that reaction is, just jot it down and bring it to the discussion we asked. And they did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And that was the final piece of it. We had this discussion group where we hosted pizza and beer to talk about it. Not wine and hors d'oeuvres like we so often, I see you hear the laughter, you know, we so often do at our organizations. We said, no way, we're going to keep this casual, pizza and beer at a local craft brewery. That discussion group lasted an hour and 20 minutes. They had a lot to say. And uh, our promise to them was that we will listen only and not jump to defense, which was an exercise that proved tremendously difficult. <laughs> and I challenged this group to do the same for the next 45 minutes or so. Listen only and not jump to defense. Challenge those assumptions. Some of what we heard was expected, and some was not. Sometimes the group agreed on certain elements of their experience, and sometimes they did not. And in an afternoon where we have heard a lot of comments about millennials already, I am here to say this is proof that all millennials are not alike, and we should stop lumping them together every time we talk about them. That's lesson number one. And uh, now we're going to hear about the rest organized again into four different areas of our findings. The first is uh, the website. One participant said, it seemed a little like inside baseball. Insiders would know these things, but it seems like you might be able to engage people with more layman terms. Another participant said, 
every time you change, speaking about domains, like when they're buying a ticket, every time you change, it makes the overall event seem less like a professional operation if it's not as seamless. And someone else said, it's like, is this piece going to be more fast paced? Is this one going to be more romantic? We can't tell from the composer. It's almost like, is this a romantic comedy or a tragedy? What we learned is that smart people want information. And some people take the time to find it on their own, and some do not. And this is not lazy. When you consider the following, somebody who is considering going to an orchestra concert has taken the following steps. One, they have considered that they might like to go to an orchestra concert. Yay, brand awareness. Great job, marketing team. <laughs> Two, that person has then gone to the website. They found us, great job SEO, digital marketing, awesome job marketing team, they came to the website. They got to step three, to browse around and look at the different concerts that they might like to attend. Great job marketing team, we have a navigable website. And then we get to step four, or the patron gets to step four, which is to make a decision on which concert might be the one that's right for them. And our response is essentially, why don't you know why Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony is a big deal? Go look it up if you want to know. <laughs> and then we wonder why the sales path gets choked up at the add to cart step. One participant looked up every piece of repertoire on our season on Wikipedia before choosing how to invest his $5. That was my reaction too. I thought, wow, this is like a little eccentric. And then somebody else chimes in and says, oh, that's a great idea. If you could provide that information, it would really help us know why you care so much about Rachmaninoff. Okay. Another per participant said, some information was in paragraph language. But when you don't go to these things regularly, that made it harder to know what makes going to this concert special. The way we present and lay out our websites makes it very difficult for a non-aficionado to understand. So what we've done about it, we learned that the title of the concert matters. They are looking at it to help glean information. Remember, is it a romantic comedy or a tragedy, right? And before, we had pretty nondescript titles uh, for all of our concerts. Season opener, season closer. I don't even know what we called the ones in the middle. I mean, <laughs> and uh, that's, this is very different than me personally. When I go to a symphony orchestra concert, I look at the program, I look at the repertoire, and that's how I make my decision. Not this group. They are seeking every clue they can to glean insight into this concert and what makes this concert special. We changed our paragraph language to bullets. We now say, what's interesting about this concert? And a couple bullets, boom, boom, boom. Answering that question, what is interesting about this concert? We use less technical language or jargon, or define those terms when we do use them. And as one person said, you are competing with 280 characters on Twitter about Donald Trump. We have made our copywriting way more casual. There's no political joke in that, just response to the comment. <laughs> so uh, the other thing we did was we linked every, every piece of repertoire is now linked to its Wikipedia page. We have it opening up in another browser tab so that uh, the user is not navigated away from our website. But we took this person's uh, experience to heart and how the rest of the group said, we want this too. And we decided, we had the internal debate of, you know, do we link people away and risk losing them? And we decided 90% aren't coming back, so we're already losing a lot of them. And if that's the choice versus helping somebody find the information they are seeking, we would much rather be in the business of education, we decided. I will give away the, or I will get to the website metrics at the end, but spoiler alert, it worked. So <laughs> <laughs> lastly, for anybody hearing all of this and thinking that swinging that copywriting pendulum too far toward casual is going to alienate our core concert subscribers, your core members, 
season ticket holders, anybody thinking that that group is going to be alienated by these changes I'm speaking about, needs to consider that these changes are to single ticket landing pages. Those people, those loyal patrons already have their tickets, the season ticket holders, the subscribers, the members. They already got their tickets. They're not looking at this, or if they are, we've already completed the sale, so it's not designed for them. These pages are for single ticket buyers or single ticket prospects. And those are the people who generally know less about the art form, hence why they are less connected to it in the first place, right? Plus, we can be informative to smart and curious people without dumbing it down. Smart and casual and approachable. Casual and approachable does not equal dumb. The next area of findings, selecting seats. One, one participant said, it's really hard to find a seat next to a friend that's already bought their ticket. And it's hard to figure out what is a good seat. Another participant said, it wasn't clear where the stage was until you looked a little closer. I had to assume that A was the first row, but it never actually says. So in general, this group is doing what every ticket buyer always does. They are trying to weigh how much they want to spend versus how much value they receive in return. And this group was incredibly thoughtful about where was the right place to sit. Blew me away how much they cared about this. And they also admitted to what they called being spoiled because of the seating apps for sports and concerts that let you see where your friends are sitting in the view from every seat. Now, some organizations, including many in this room, have very robust select a seat features. And uh, this is one of those areas of the conversation where I really had to listen only and not jump to defense, because our venue controls our sales path. I just heard an mmm, like, preach it, girl. OK, this, I've, <laughs> I have found my people. OK. Um, and the, no matter where you are on the spectrum, though, uh, everybody needs to hear this, whether you have robust select see features, and, and I've worked at those organizations, or if you're in the camp that I am now and you don't have very much control at all over the purchase path, hear me in saying this. When Live Nation is our competitor, meaning that their prices are on par with ours, they are setting the standard, and the standard is an easy login with Facebook feature where you can quickly see which of your friends have already purchased tickets and quickly see where they are sitting and easily add a seat to your cart and have an easy checkout process that is about 30 seconds that doesn't really ask you for that much information beyond what is absolutely necessary to complete the ticket purchase. Oh, and then an easy email confirmation that says, do you want to easily add this to your calendar on iCal, Gmail, mobile, desktop, or Outlook? Let's be honest, no matter where we fall, arts organizations of all sizes make it much more difficult than that to purchase a ticket. So what we've done about it. Again, of all of the areas of focus, this one for us is the toughest. We have tried working with our venue to move ticketing in-house so that we could have the control that we wanted over the sales path. And we have made a compromise that we control the sales path during the subscription renewal period. So that's a pretty big victory. We now get to control this fully for our most loyal patrons. However, that's not this conversation. That's not this presentation. That's not who we're talking about right now. And the latest data, uh, at least for symphony orchestras, and I know it's comparable, if not exactly the same for other arts disciplines, is that now single ticket buyers are amounting to more revenue each season than subscribers. And if your organization quite isn't at that tipping point, you're probably approaching it because that is the trend. So again, when we are talking about this group of people, single ticket buyers, first time attendees, we at the California Symphony have some work to do here still. Our venue's website does offer uh, the view from any seat in the house feature. So again, I'm just listening only at this point in the discussion. And what I realized is it was not readily apparent to anybody <laughs> in the room that this feature exists. So the lesson is just because the functionality is there does not mean it is apparent to the user. 
Think about that. OK, so we have, uh, in response to all of this, made our website match the sales domain as much as possible. We have added colors. We have added fonts. We send them images. Whatever we can do to try to make that experience as seamless as possible. Uh, we have also added basic pricing info. That was something that came up from this group, that they had to get pretty deep into the sales path before they could see what a seat actually cost. So we, uh, we always say that price is more about value than the dollar itself, but uh, we use this as an opportunity to talk about dynamic pricing and how if you don't wait to buy, you can give, get a better deal because you bought early. And we've seen some success from that. OK, the third area of our four different areas of findings. What do I wear? And other burning questions. One participant said, I wore my Mr. Rogers sweater. Another participant said, you hear symphony. And you think, oh my god, that's so expensive. Just the word symphony. Knowing the pricing options that are available would probably aid or dismay my willingness to go. I want to pluck an oboe. Do you pluck an oboe? OK, the conundrum of what to wear. The pain is real, y'all. <laughs> Uh, I had no idea that this question alone brought about so much stress and concern. And even in cool and casual California, where it doesn't matter what you wear, it really brought the drama and the stress and the concern. And stress and concern are two negative emotions that are being associated with our product and the experience we are trying to offer before the experience ever even begins. So while I could laugh it off, and I, I kind of do right now, I chuckle, we shouldn't. Those are negative emotions that we definitely don't want associated with the experience we are trying to provide. Additionally, we wrongly expected people to have a basic understanding of all of the instruments in the orchestra, or at least what they are named. And what we learned is that this level of basic understanding should not be assumed. So for me, this was a moment where I had to say why. Why I realized, do I preach that the decline in music education in this country is one of the top reasons why we are seeing declines in our audiences, and yet I had done nothing to help the people who are a product of this lack of education, today's grown adults, millennials and Gen Xers, I had done nothing to help them uh, understand the things that they were never taught in the first place. It's not basic if it was never taught. One person said, is there a separate web page you could make for younger people that answers some of these questions? And what was so interesting about that comment was that the assumption was that there are older people uh, who, who somehow are more familiar. They assumed they were in the minority and that there was some magical age at which one becomes an aficionado. And we know that's not true. Is there a magical age at which one becomes an aficionado about our art form? No. So the reality is there is no magical age. And uh, there are people who do know a lot about the symphony orchestra, a lot about the opera, the ballet, visual arts. Of course there are a lot of people who know a lot about these disciplines. But those are the people, once again, who are already subscribers, already our loyal patrons. So when we are talking about single ticket sales, it is very possible that almost nobody has any prior understanding, foundational knowledge of the symphony concert experience, of the art form you are offering experience. As arts administrators, it is our job to fill in that gap and fix that. This was a huge mind shift for me. So in response, the first thing we did was create a newcomer's guide. Now that is not revolutionary. I know many organizations already have newcomer's guide, 101 pages, FAQ pages, that type of a thing. 
But for us, what was different is that every question on that page came directly from this group. So every question was real, actually being asked, and our answers were written in a way that felt more authentic, and as if we were actually talking to somebody on the other side, and we were. Very quickly, that page became one of the top 10 most trafficked pages on our website, and it holds that position to this day. And I was reminded, even when I worked for the bigger organizations, yes, those types of pages, the Newcomer's Guide, always held a pretty prominent page in terms of most trafficked pages on the website. We also re-examined our pre-concert emails. So this is another area of working in partnership with our venue and another area that needed more attention on our part, we learned. So our venue did, does, send courtesy reminders to patrons who've already bought tickets. You know, your upcoming performance this weekend, those types of courtesy emails. They do send that. Although we learned from this group, those emails did not even include the California Symphony by name. <laughs> Nor include other pertinent questions or information such as how to pre-order drinks, how to listen to the music in advance on Spotify, none of that. So, funny enough, we used to send in-house our version of the pre-performance emails, then had stopped a few months before this project took place, thinking, oh, the venue is so helpful doing this for us, one thing off our plate. Well, needless to say, <laughs> those pre-performance reminders are back in-house, back in play now. The fourth area of our findings. What we learned about the concert experience. One participant said, it, speaking about program notes, sounds like a wine description. <laughs> Another person said, you go to a place to experience culture, but the lack of diversity made it feel uncultured. It was so impressive. I didn't expect it to feel that different than Spotify. <laughs> I was in awe. I felt awe. This is one area where we are all doing some things right. But first, we're going to look at a few other places that need some attention. Diversity. This is a problem not just at the California Symphony, but for all of us, right? And I will come back to this in a bit, and we will talk more about diversity. But for now, let me be the one to say that, yes, a first-timer at my organization picked up on this right away. And yes, it did negatively impact that person's experience. Program notes. Program notes had varying opinions, widely varying opinions, and a lot of discussion from this group. Now, some people wanted to get to the concert, read the book voraciously from cover to cover in advance, whereas other people sort of wanted to set it aside, maybe read it later, and instead just sort of take in the experience as it comes. Who has seen these two types of people at your venues? Yeah, of course. Uh, these, these two types of behaviors are not unique to newcomers. They are true among all visitors at our venues, all attendees. So regardless, though, of wherever they fell into which camp, they were universally quick to tell us how dry the program book, and particularly the program notes, can be. Sounds like a wine description. One program book success we learned, though, was in storytelling. So at about this point in the discussion, somebody speaks up and says, Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony should have never happened. And somebody else chimes in and says, that's right. His first symphony was a disaster, and he waited 20 years before he got up the gall to write his second. And somebody else speaks up and says, oh my gosh, but boy, when he did, it took a lot of gumption, and it was marvelous. <laughs> OK, so at this point, I am feeling so proud of my young protégés who have learned so much about Rachmaninoff. And then somebody else speaks up and says, Whoever wrote those program notes should write them all. To which I replied, 
the same person did write them all. So I drill a little deeper, probe some more, and what comes out is that the other program notes, the other pieces on the program, were written in a much more technical way. They were all written by a musicologist, but they had more jargon, they had more uh, technical language, musicological language, you know, listen for the melody when it passes from this instrument to that, or here's the list of the instrumentation. Remember, they don't even know all the names of the instruments in the orchestra, so no wonder that's not what stuck with them. But the story, the story is what they remembered, and two weeks later, were repeating back to me. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. Lastly, the good, the music itself, the art itself. The sentiment of complete awe was echoed by virtually every person at the table. And I was reminded that symphony orchestras, that all arts disciplines, provide something that no other entertainment option can hold a candle to. We are an immersive engine, a force of sound, and what we do is untouchably beautiful when performed at the highest levels as our artists so often deliver. The programming and the music itself is not the problem. And as an industry, we have got to stop tinkering with this and over-focusing on this. I'm not saying we shouldn't think about it at all. I'm saying that in the last 30 minutes, I have mentioned some other areas that desperately need our attention. And until we pay some attention to that, and some of those are big bodies of work, I know. But until we start paying these other things the attention that they deserve, and focus on these other areas. The challenges that we collectively face with growing our audiences will not be overcome. So what we've done about it. We have stopped stressing over programming. This is very liberating. We no longer ask ourselves, do we need to do a movie concert or, or more movie concerts or more pops concerts or less pops concerts? Do we need to program more Beethoven or less Beethoven? Should we program more new music or less new music? Should we have rush hour concerts? None of those questions are bad questions. Those questions, in fact, showcase the breadth of what a symphony orchestra has to offer. But not one person in the focus group said, I need a shorter concert. Mm -mm. And not one person said, I need to hear more fill in the blank composer. Nobody said that. They do desperately want to learn about all of that, though. And as an industry, we do not cater to that very well. So as such, we have doubled down on our program book. We had already been in transition to make the book and the notes in it more accessible. And we, on the topic of program notes in particular, we went to our program annotator. We have uh, a highly qualified person writing our program notes. Scott Fogelsong is a professor at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. He also writes program notes for San Francisco Symphony. And we went to him and we said, Scott, here's the feedback we're hearing. Um, do you think you could focus on the story a little more, the story behind the music, the composers, and all of your program notes going forward? And his answer, absolutely, because there are so many salacious stories in classical music that I can be telling. <laughs> so we are now focusing on those juiciest parts. Okay, diversity, I said we'd come back to this. About a year ago, the California Symphony, to my knowledge, was one of the, the first, maybe, maybe the very first, professional orchestra to make a public commitment to diversity across all facets of our organization. The composers were programming, the people on stage, the staff in the office, and the board. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it gets better. OK. So we also decided. After, uh, after a year of some of these changes, this is now moving into sort of maybe phase two of this project, we decided, you know, maybe it's time to put our money where our mouth is. 
So we did a very simple experiment over this past season where we started running digital ads both in English and in Spanish. So in the same way we realized that we target our digital ads to uh, you know, pop culture lovers get this version of the ad, the family concerts were targeting families and moms and dads with this version of the ad, we could very easily translate our ads into Spanish for people who are native Spanish speakers. We said that is the easiest test, fewest resources, let's give it a try. And to put this in perspective with a finer point, our community where we are based, again, just outside of San Francisco, is about 25% Hispanic and Latino. Our baseline data before any of these changes took place showed that on any given concert, about two to 3% of our audience was Hispanic or Latino. Okay, big gap there, right? So to give away the end of the story, there's a little bit of math, so you gotta track with me. You will hear me say that uh, we sold out so many concerts that in response to that, we added inventory. Okay, we added, in fact, this past season, 33% more seats over the season prior. So if you're tracking with me on all of this, if we were to grow our audience to be truly representative of the community we serve, meaning we grow our audience from that two to 3% baseline of Hispanic and Latino audiences to 25%, and we did the same thing with Asians, baseline data, six to 8%, if we grew that to closer to 10 or 15% to be reflective of the community, if we did that, every one of those newly added seats would be filled with need to add more. Diversity matters not just because our feet are being held to the fire, not just because uh, the industry says we gotta figure it out, not just because it's trendy, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because there is money on the table. <laughs> it's important, and it is our job to realize that. Okay, so some things we are still working on. Other, other findings from this study. Uh, this group said that we should include pricing information on our acquisition campaigns. Now again, I said earlier, pricing to me is always a matter of value, value proposition, not necessarily price alone. Um, so that's why we are not printing our prices on all of our materials. However, what they did say was that they would much rather go to three concerts for $25 each over one concert for $75. We said, okay, so we use that to inform some subscription and small package strategies, three for $99 and that sort of thing. They said, add something additional to the experience. This matches exactly research that came out of the League of American Orchestras in partnership with the consulting firm Oliver Wyman. That research was released uh, in late 2016, about the same time we were doing this project, and it said just this, that people do want to make a night of their uh, artistic outing. They do want to go to dinner. They do want to go to drinks. And this group said it can be very simple. You don't have to launch your whole young patrons club. They said it can be as easy as we are going to drinks here afterwards, or we're going to go to dinner here beforehand. They said we just want to meet other people. Okay. Fix seat selection so it's awesome. Again, Live Nation is the standard. We charge a lot for our ticket prices, particularly the performing arts organizations. That's the standard, we've gotta to rise to it. Make changing domains seamless. They can tell, period. They want more information on each piece in advance. We are continually trying to provide this. In addition to all the Wikipedia links, we started publishing our program notes, all these great stories we're now telling. We started publishing them in advance. We said, great, that's an easy blog post. People want this stuff, they're looking for it. Event calendar is important. This is another one of those areas where I was reminded, oh yes, when I worked at the bigger organizations, the event calendar was a highly trafficked part of our website. And at the California Symphony, our first response was, oh my gosh, we're a small budget, we don't, we're not performing that much. And then we realized, now we're in the middle of a whole website redesign based on now a year and a half of all of these findings put into practice. And so we've worked with our design firm saying, how do we create a calendar experience when uh, we're not performing 52 weeks a year? And we've come up with a solution, looks, you know, looks like a list rather than a, you know, all that kind of thing, where we realized we are very busy even when we're not performing. Who feels busy even when they're not performing? <laughs> yeah, so all right, we got the calendar coming soon. 
concert suggestions, a you might also like feature, they requested that. Again, they are trying so hard to figure out what makes this concert special? What is the right performance for me to attend? They're looking for that kind of suggestion. And lastly, every performance must be great. Whether a large organization or a small organization, we do need to be cognizant that every performance must be great. Epic, even, as one participant said. We can never dial it in, not as performers, not as administrators. And new attendees, and even all attendees, I would venture to say, are deeply looking for an experience where they can learn, feel inspired, and feel welcomed and unintimidated about it. As professional top quality organizations, we need to deliver this every single time. So some conclusions and results. I promise we would come back to this. Before this project took place, our average concert capacity was about 80% sold. After these changes took place, Eric said this at the beginning, we started selling out concerts, multiple sellouts in a row, and then the average attendance was 84% sold. So much so that, as I mentioned earlier, we had to add performances in the 17-18 season in order to accommodate the demand. Who wants to add performances in order to accommodate the demand of your growing audience? Like some of you, cheers, applause, yay! <laughs> Uh, website metrics and the Google Analytics showed that the, we saw a 12 to 13% lift from people going from those single ticket landing pages onto the purchase path. Who wants a 12 to 13% lift of people going from their overview pages to the uh, sales path? Good, yes, love it. And then this played out a little bit in our subscription brochure as well. As I've said all throughout, this is primarily a single ticket project. However, some of these things, three for 99, yes, we incorporated that, but also we decided, let's tell all our subscribers what's interesting about this concert. And now that's in our subscription brochure for the past two years. What's interesting about this concert? Boom, boom, boom. Our subscription renewal rates are approaching 90% and higher. And that is among a growing subscriber base. Who wants a subscriber renewal rate of 90%? Thank you. All of this is a very different story than most orchestras and a lot of arts organizations are able to tell. So our top 10 takeaways. As an industry, we do not have a new audiences problem. We are collectively great at attracting new audiences. We are collectively terrible at retaining them. It's not a new audiences problem. The problem instead is, or the problem additionally, I should say, is not caused by programming. So much of the time, programming is our first stop to try to address the audience's problem. That should not be our first stop. Instead, what is causing the problem are, by and large, our own cognitive biases. Availability heuristic. The solution is in three parts. Part one is UX research. Go to your users, ask them about the experience. The solution part two is to Challenge our own assumptions. Remember, listen only, not jump to defense. It's very difficult. Uh, part three of the solution is to apply the user experience research to the experience at hand, both on stage and off, online, online and in person. This does not have to cost a lot or anything. Round one of this project, again, cost us pretty much zero dollars. The only exception would be the pizza and beer. The process is iterative. That word has been said a lot today. The process is iterative. We test, and then we measure, and then we put some big money behind it when we're ready. Jim Collins says it this way, if there are any Jim Collins fans in the room. He says, first fire bullets before you fire cannonballs. And that's exactly what we've done. We had a year or so of testing all of these things, measuring and tracking, and then, then we decided we're ready for the website redesign and ready to put big dollars behind it. And when we put that RFP together and started working with the firm, we knew exactly what we wanted and knew exactly how to measure the proposals we've received. 
burst fire bullets, and then cannonballs. And then lastly, number 10, the art is what we do best. That is good news. <laughs> So there you have it, an hour and 20 minute discussion, which produced for the California Symphony 11 typed pages of notes, four pages of which were direct action items, uh, a blog post that went viral, coverage by the Wall Street Journal, this presentation, and tens of thousands of dollars saved over hiring a consultancy to tell us all of these same things. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you will share this with your staffs and with your boards. And more than anything, I hope that as an industry, we will question our own availability heuristic and take more seriously and act on the feedback we are hearing from the audiences we so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for some questions. I see hands. I just wanted to know what the size of your group was that you did the research with. Oh, many? let's see here. We had in the room about 20 or so people. More than that, a few more than that had come to concerts. But yeah, the group itself is about 20. Oh, hello. <laughs> Uh, so I had a question um, about your uh, advertising for I'm over here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was like, I hear the voice. Uh, for uh, your in in Spanish, which yeah. I think is really exciting. Um, how far down like the purchase path did you make things um, like Spanish or accessible in bilingual? That is such a great question. So iterative process, right? At the beginning, nothing. So uh, the results of that are only by running digital ads in Spanish, we grew our households, our Hispanic and Latino households by 50% in one year. Now the baseline was pretty low, so great, we went up. But, uh, but again, now this new website we're developing, the whole website, English and in Spanish, so that we will be able to show people an ad in their native language and then have them land on a website also in that language. So yeah, that's a great question. Me? Okay, hi. Oh, I'm over here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm just curious how you forced yourself to stop and take the time to do this and then implement your findings. I think the problem probably a lot of us have in the room is that there's so much to do and never enough time to do it all. Yeah, that is such a real question. Uh, I think for me, it came from a place of dissatisfaction. I just thought we are doing the same things. It is a lot of work. Is there a way that we can still work very hard and do different work and get different results? And that, for me, just really motivated me. And I said, I personally am going to lead this project. I'm not going to pawn it off on another staff member who doesn't feel the passion that I feel. Um, and then it's been awesome. You know, as we have the results, you know, of course, people have come along, and it's been great. But I said, I'm going to do this. I want to know. So, and like anything in life, you make it a priority and then you carve out the time. But yeah, I think it started from a place of, is there another way to do this? Why are 90% not coming back? That seems unacceptable. Yeah. Hi, um, this is just a technical question. Um, great presentation, by the way. I really like the nuts and bolts of the actual website you went into, which was fantastic. When you said that they noticed that the, the difference between your purchase path and your website, was it just the domain changing? Or was it, I mean, also the physical look of it? Our physical look between our purchase path and our website are very similar, but our domains do change. And I always assumed that was something, oh, no one's going to notice that unless they're technically proficient, but it's you, yeah. you, they were picking up on it. Okay. I would say if it is very seamless, probably maybe most users wouldn't be able to tell. That's okay. just, that's my sense. That's not based on data. Um, in our case, it's very different. And okay. so, and it was so obvious. So I imagine that the goal should always be, we want a seamless website experience as much as we can offer and control that. Got it, thank you. To your left, hi. Hi. 
I'm struggling. You know? <laughs> um, I just want to say that I've really enjoyed watching this project unfold over the last few years on Medium. Yeah. Um, California Symphony is definitely one of the the leaders in the orchestra field in the digital space when it comes to stuff like this. And they've also got a really great composer in residence program. Yes, um, love this question. <laughs> to the actual question, um, I'm curious about how the mobile experience went into any feedback or if any, you guys have done any work regarding mobile specifically. Yes, so the new website, mobile first, absolutely. So that was a must for us. I think, um, and this is where it gets so challenging on the sales path, because even the new website, we don't control the purchase path, and we went through all that and tried really hard, and you know, so um, we have been able as much as we can to go directly to um, not just our venue, but their ticketing software, and we're trying to do as much as we can to just do what we can do, because we believe that it will make the experience better. Um, but yes, I'm trying to remember when we were doing the RFP, I think, I mean, half the website traffic is mobile. I think, and when I worked for the Bumbershoot Festival, it was almost everything was mobile, so it was like mission critical. I mean, 50% is high. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, it's a high priority. And this is where I just feel like we've got to do everything we can. And uh, the other side of that coin is we can only do everything we can. And that's where we are. And as long as we're still seeing results, then okay, iterative, we're going in the right direction, one step at a time. Hopefully that helps. Hi, over here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, how did you find the people to participate in your discussion group? Because they weren't customers. That's right, they weren't customers. So we put out another blog post on Medium with the call that I outlined. We said, we want you to sign up. Here are the expectations. Come to a concert, cost five bucks. Everyone you come to, you gotta go to this one. You gotta go to the discussion group. We'll feed you pizza and beer, you know, all that. Put in a blog post. And that in itself was pretty widely shared. Um, you know, just by saying, hey, we wanna hear from people, who, just like I said, who should go to the symphony but don't. Uh, we would really love to hear what is turning you off, basically. And so, apparently people love to share that. So, <laughs> so we put out the call, we said email us if you're interested, and pretty much, I think we had maybe double the actual participants in the room reach out and say, yeah, I'm interested. And almost everybody made the cut. The only reason you wouldn't, uh, would be there were a couple of people who were like, oh, I love the symphony and I want everybody to experience it. And we said, nah, 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 nah. that's not you, this is not for you. Um, but anyways, yeah, that's what we did. Yeah. Hi, uh, so I am very, pa I see uh, very passionate about the idea of customer centricity in the arts, but I find, I found it very frustrating uh, sometimes working with an artistic leader of an organization um, who is who where it feel where you where changes about customer centricity sometimes read to them as dis as like a disregard for or a or for the art on for the art that you're putting on stage um, and I wonder if you had any experience or advice on how to have those conversations and how to get institutional priorities behind things like this without you know, rocking the boat too much in yeah. the wrong way? That is also a very real question. Um, I am very lucky in that I have a fantastic music director who is so supportive. So in that sense, I'm sorry because I do, I'm very lucky in that, I know that. Um, I think what I have done most of my life, anytime I was in a situation where I believed in something I was doing and wasn't getting the buy-in I needed from whoever that is, I always go back to the data. And somebody else gave that answer to a similar question earlier. I learned very early on that I can use data to prove a point. And then I'm not arguing, then it's not subjective, it's saying look at the results. Who can argue with more people in the concert hall? Who can argue with a subscriber base that's growing and a high renewal rate, you know? So sometimes, sometimes I think it's better to just ask for forgiveness later. Don't ask for permission. Yeah, I think that matches with what Seth was saying earlier, actually, where he was like, we've just, somebody's gotta break the rules a little bit. So, I don't want to get you fired, so maybe don't take that <laughs> advice. Hi, um, congratulations on the case study, that was fascinating. Can you talk about how um, your strategy influenced development and fundraising? Uh, any learnings there? Oh man, do I wanna talk about that. Okay, 
that is, I, I give this whole other talk on how we should break down the silos and work together. Oh my gosh, plug for the podcast, because I talk about it on the podcast. Um, but yes, I think, I mean, okay, so here, what's the short version, Aubrey? The short version is all of this is a pipeline. If we, so at the California Symphony, I gave the stat, 90% of first timers don't come back. That means 10% are the ones who do. At California Symphony, it's, it, this gets to development eventually, I promise. At California Symphony, we've gone from a 10% retention rate. Now we're up to about 30% retention rate. Part of that is because in addition to all of the things I outlined here, trying to improve the experience, Part of that is we are not soliciting those people for a donation. So part of the experience is how are we inviting them to come back again? And all of the research shows that if you can get a first time attendee to come back again within a 12 month period, their lifetime value to your organization skyrockets. Well, guess who are the top prospects for season tickets? Multi-buyers, so we've got this whole plan for our first timers, for our multi-buyers, and then for our new first year subscribers, we don't even solicit them for a donation. We said no, the only next step we want those people to take is to renew their subscription. Well, notice our renewal rates are very high. And then when somebody is a second year renewing subscriber is when we start making the donation ask. Now, if you think, oh my gosh, what are you doing? You're cutting off a revenue stream. Hear what I said at the beginning. Over the last four years, we have doubled our audience and quadrupled our donor base. So we're not losing money on the development side, but it's been really deliberate and really focused. And I think that takes so much restraint, maturity, discipline for both on the development side and the marketing side to say, no, we have the same goal, but we gotta really work together to get there. Could you talk a little bit more about that onboarding process for the multi-buyers, for the single ticket buyers? How do you then get that you know, increase from that 10% to the 30? What are the actual steps that you take? Yeah, oh my gosh, you guys, this is a whole nother talk I give. This is amazing. I'm just gonna be up here for another hour, okay? <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, the quick answer is, let's see. I always say, normally at an organization, a first time buyer, gets like bombarded with information. A first time buyer gets the subscription ask, the donation ask, the digital retargeting, the subscription brochure in the mail, you know, all the things. And then uh, what we've done is said no. For a first time attendee, the only next step we are going to take is to invite them to come back again. So hopefully we've done everything we can to make the concert experience welcoming and intimidating, all those things I talked about, and then part of that is when they arrive, they, uh, they get four communications. When they arrive, there's a letter on their seat hey, we noticed this is your first time here, or first in a while, there, people have dropped off, we, we count them back as newcomers. Uh, we are so glad you're here, we noticed this, and we would love to have you back again, here's an aggressive offer and a deadline. After the concert, they get an email, same th basically the same language. About a week or so after the concert takes place, they get a postcard in the mail, same language. The image on the postcard is, has something to do with the concert they just came to, so sort of like memory elicitation. Same message, notice it's your first time or first time in a while, so glad you came, we'd love to have you back again. Here's the offer, here's the deadline. And then finally, before the deadline, a, a fourth communication, which is another email saying, don't forget, we'd love to have you back. So first time attendees are getting four different communications. Now, from all of our organizations, generally first time attendees are getting four communications, it's just that they're not focused and they're these different messages. So that alone, combi or that combined with this, has really helped that retention rate jump up. Hi, I have the microphone middle back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, were there any uh, front of house lobby concession usher changes that came about based on the feedback from your group? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, this is another area of working in partnership with our venue. And I think I mean, no, I, you know, we, I, I will say the box office is great. The box office, I think, is one of the strongest parts of the venue um, in terms of being great to work with and generally pretty uh, customer focused. Um, you know, I think, what I, here's what I've noticed. When you start creating a culture, this is a culture that's welcoming. This is a culture that doesn't shush you when you clap between movements. In fact, we say on our program book, clap when you like what you hear, put your phones on and silent, 
Uh, what else do we say? Uh, grab your drinks, bring them to your seats, uh, listen to the playlist on Spotify. We say all that in our program book, like setting the expectation. And now what happens when you come to a concert, after the first movement of a symphonic piece, people erupt. Well, what, a, what is one usher gonna do about that? So um, I think when you create a culture, you just gotta get on board or get off the train. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, right here. Um, uh, how did you come up with the methodology for the actual study in terms of like, okay, we're gonna take this amount of people and mm. put them in a room and give them access to the concerts? How did you kind of land on that? Yeah, I think my approach was sort of twofold. On one hand, in my previous jobs, I had been a part of a lot of different research projects. And so I had all of that prior experience with focus groups, other kind of research, working with firms, doing it in-house. So I had a lot of um, good experience to draw on as I was approaching this project. So I had all that. On the other hand, here I am at a much smaller organization with no budget to put toward this, except for pizza and beer. And uh, so there was a little bit of do something or nothing? What is my choice? Well, do something, let's forge ahead. So it was a little bit of, um, yeah, I'm just going to do it because I want to do it based on what I already know from my other jobs. 